Friends, welcome back to another episode of the Strong Life Podcast. We have a great guest this episode, Coach Bill Gillespie, who's been in the Iron Game <clears throat> for decades and has gone through, you know, me being a bit of a historian, these uh, generations and different phases of the fitness world. Strength, you know, I don't like to say I'm part of the fitness industry, Bill. Guys like you and I are the strength industry. But you have gone through these very unique, you know, times in the world of strength and conditioning back when I don't even know if it was called strength and conditioning. And I've been trying to make this podcast to happen for a while, Bill, because um, years ago I was following, I guess, one of your assistants at Liberty had an Instagram page and was, you know, sharing the videos of the athletes as well as you guys lifting. So I messaged them and they never got back to me. And I knew you weren't running the Instagram because I know you're not a big tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody ever got back to me. And finally we get to make this happen. I'm excited. So thanks for the time. Right now you're in Texas, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I'm college station. Nice. What is like, what do you have going on today over there in Texas? Well, uh, uh, Rachel Ellsworth, who is the uh, one of the strength coaches at Texas A&M, we actually shared an office together at the University of Washington, wow. and we're training partners, and um, she's awesome. One of the most knowledgeable, best strength coaches I know, a dear friend of mine. So uh, I told her, I said, hey, I'm going to be in Texas. I'd love to get together with you, and she said she had some young strength coaches that would like to go and uh, have some little Q&A. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, all right, let's do it. So yes. uh, I'm going to go over there this uh, afternoon and spend some time together with her. Now, Bill, what's interesting is the uh, a recent episode I did with Pops, Richard Soren, we got into, I'm a big historian, you know, my, my friends <clears throat> who are maybe a little older than me always say, Zach, you should have been born in the 60s. So in the <laughs> 70s, you could have driven cross country to Zuver's gym and you know, all these things. Yeah. And so a, a strength coach from a very big D1 university, when I was talking with Pops, he, he's like, I didn't even know who those guys were. We spoke about Zuver's gym. We spoke about Phil Gripaldi. We spoke about the York barbell strength picnics and they didn't know who they were. So what'll be interesting is <clears throat> you're going to have the Q and A with coaches today. You have been coaching and lifting you know, probably 10, 15, 20 years longer than they've been alive. Yeah. I mean, you know how many squats you have seen compared <laughs> to, and so it's such a unique coach's eye. So it's going to be interesting to, you know, the question that these young, co I, I feel like that, you know, the coaches, younger coaches, and, and I'm 45, but I feel like it's important to know where methods started, who started them, why, you know, how did they tweak them? What were the things they did with the most raw and simplistic um, weight room setups. And so we're going to get into that. I'm really excited, Bill, <clears throat> to kind of you know, grill you. <laughs> you know, Zach, I, you know, it, with a lot of the technology that's out there today, yeah, people are, you know, different people tell me, oh, I have to get this. I have to get right. that. And I'm like, well, my eye, I, I can see all that. Yes. Give me something that I can't see. That's what I want in your technology. It's like, why in the world are you going to make me a bench press machine? I don't need a bench press machine. I have a bench press. <clears throat> Same thing in, in, in a lot of the technology is that they're just duplicating. What they're doing is, is they're, they're not uh, an experienced eye can see these things. Yes. An inexperienced eye can't see them. So they think it's like revolutionary, but if you're around this stuff long enough, it's, you know, we can see these sort of things. So I think that showing the respect to the person that's been on the platform, that's been under the barbell for a long time, is really important that we do that. Yes, it is. <clears throat> and I think as a coach, you learn these, the nuances of how they did stuff with zero technology and really minimal equipment or they were making their own equipment like pops <laughs> yeah. or you know guys like bill peanuts west he mm -hmm. had the york isometric rack but he wanted to box squat inside of it so they cut it opened it up somebody welded it for them and <clears throat> you know i have um it's on my desk 
uh, Jim Wendler gave me all the original West Side Barbell articles from the late 60s and early 70s for Muscle Builder and Power. Do you remember those articles? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, Dr. Ken photocopied all of them, gave them to Jim. Jim gave them to me. And I hope that my son will read them. And I always say, come down into the office and get lost in the books. Because when I was a kid, Bill, I would fall asleep reading bodybuilding magazines. Yeah. And it reminded me of like pumping iron where Matty Ferrigno said Louie would, he'd see Louie at 3 a.m. reading the muscle magazines, you know, with his little nightlight. I couldn't stop reading that stuff. And so I feel like this conversation is going to be a trip in time with coach Bill Gillespie. It's going to be exciting. So Bill, awesome. you, you grew up in Washington state, correct? Yes. And um, I don't know like who your mentors were, but when I hear Washington state, I think of Doyle Kennedy, the powerlifter. You know, he, he, I didn't even start <clears throat> lifting at that time when Doyle was doing his thing. I was in Virginia mm -hmm. during that time. Uh, he, he was down in Salem, Oregon. Okay. Um, Oregon. But uh, I didn't really have a mentor uh, at, at a high school. Um, I just had a barbell, had 180 pounds. And uh, I tell everybody, yeah, I, I could clean and jerk it with my right arm. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> but, uh, you know, but I couldn't bench worth a lick, but I could, I had a pretty good clean and jerk. And I love, I've always loved the Olympic lifting. Um, uh, I just wasn't that good at it, but, uh, I love coaching it. I love, uh, uh I love to, I love to study it. It's um, what, yeah. um but, Bill, what year were you, you know, you mentioned when you started lifting, I guess, was it in high school? It was actually uh, junior high. I was 14 years old for Christmas. My mom and dad got me a Sears uh, weightlifting set, the old plastic with concrete, yes. you know, in the oh, middle. Yeah. 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 And the, the workout had a little book and I figured that it had a 10, five and two and a half. So I did everything with the 10, five, two and a half on it. I didn't, need, and I would do it like three times a day. All you know, we up playing and you know, with the friends and everything. And I, I, I got to go do my workout, man. Yeah. I follow that little book, man. I was just to the letter. But information back then was, it was next to impossible to get a hold of. You know, right. you, you know, you get the muscle fitness, different muscle magazines. But even then, you know, the great, uh, you know, I talked with Mike Bridges. Yeah. And uh, I said, Mike, I said, you know, I used to read all your articles. I said, did you actually do those workouts? He goes, heck no. He goes, I wasn't about to go tell you everybody what I was doing. He goes, he goes, I just got paid to put together a routine. And uh, he put little nuggets in there, you know, like uh, one of the nuggets he put in there. And I asked him if he really did it was, I noticed that uh, he'd do his third warm up with 315 and he would do it for three sets of three. I said, did you actually do that? He goes, yes. I says, yeah, when I don't feel good, I will do that over and over and over and over until I do feel good. And I can take a day where you don't feel like working out to one of your best days ever by doing that little, little trick. But man, a little nugget of, it was like so precious. This was so hard. And then in the mid eighties, when Louis started writing for powerlifting USA, right. I remember the first article and I went to my mentor, Dave Williams, who happened to be the guy who introduced bands to Louis. And, uh, I said, I said, oh my gosh, I just read the greatest information. I said, this is gold. Every paragraph, this guy knows what he's talking about. And my mentor goes, that's the guy I've been trying to tell you to listen to for a long time. Oh, I heard this story. He brought Dick Hartzell out, right? Or like uh, your buddy Dave, you know, I guess connected with Dick Hartzell, connected with Louie. Yeah. Yeah. He would, uh, he 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 would uh he, he would kept going he knew there was something that you could do with these bands he wasn't sure what it was but coach williams was extremely uh creative uh uh with you know exercise and, and designing equipment and uh he and he was good friends with louie and he would go up there and, and had family up near there near columbus so he'd always go hang out with louie and one time he said you know he brought up the um uh, uh, the bands and said, Louie, I don't know what you're going to do with these, but I know this is something that's going to help make guys stronger. 
And Louis said they sat in the corner for about a year. And one day he said, man, instead of these chains, we should try these bands. You know, the rest is history, you know? It's so, yeah, so interesting. The me- I feel like we really respected information because it was very hard to obtain it. And so, you know, you mentioned Olympic lifting. When did you start lifting weights? Was that early 80s? What? No. Uh, Late 70s? No, uh, probably early 70s. Early 70s, which yeah. is kind of the end of the strength. I mean, Strength and Health magazine was out, but now yeah. Arnold comes to America. Joe Weider, marketing extraordinaire, takes Arnold's information and now high volume bodybuilding kind of takes off, even though those bodybuilders did some powerlifting, but it was really the the men of the 50s and 60s, or even if we look at the 40s with John Grimmick, they were competitive bodybuilders, sometimes pro bodybuilders, and they were representing a United States in Olympic lifting. Whereas once the 70s came along, it was like Olympic lifting wasn't, you know, uh, prominent. Although some of these magazines like um, Iron Man would feature everything, bodybuilding, powerlifting, and Olympic lifting. So you had, you started training at such an interesting time, Bill, with this, you know, certain things fading out like Olympic lifting, right? Mm -hmm. Where were you going to find an Olympic lifting club? Powerlifting was an underground sport and even bodybuilding was viewed as very strange, you know, and then the machines were starting to come into play with, you know, Jacqueline um, health clubs, you know, exploding. So here you are, you get your Sears, you know, um, barbell. How did you, why were you so strong to be able to one arm clean and jerk 180 on a barbell? What were you doing leading up to that that got you strong? Well, I, I, I always wanted to be strong. I don't remember a day in my life since I was an infant that I didn't want to be strong. And um, in fact, my mom used to use it kind of against me. She'd tell me if I rake the uh, yard, I get, I get big muscles. And I'd go out there and rake it twice, you know, because I'm like, man, I can feel that. That, that burns. Yep. You know, I was just, you know, seven, you know, six, seven years old, you know. Um, I just, I wanted to be strong. It was important to me, but back then we, we had to learn so much, uh, under the bar, you know, you're just, you're constantly lifting and you had to use your intuition of going, well, that worked. Now, why did it work? You know, and that was, that was a confusing thing, you know? And, um, t- t- recently I've really kind of developed, um, understanding that there's two types of strength training you know there's a a strength training to exhibit maximum strength and then there's strength training to develop maximum strength Mm. and um and then there's of course bodybuilding and what happens is 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 of those two methods you have to use both of them honestly at the same time but different percentages of emphasis while you're training it and that's been one of the keys for me is understanding and, and uh, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. But it was because I spent so much time under the bar lifting that I was able to understand that. It's a, uh, I had a coach tell me one time, he said, he says, you, uh, I, I drive a, a, a silver Tundra. Okay. And he says, you notice how nobody, uh, you never notice a silver Tundra until you buy one. Yeah. And then. And then, and then everywhere you go, you notice, wow, there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. But before that, you never noticed them. Well, it's the same thing's true when you go to lifting, okay? You experiment. You try something and you go. Pretty soon you start to go, hey, wait a minute. I, I recognize that. I, I, that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And so you start to understand why you do it. And so when these young strength coaches don't put time under the bar and they have the book knowledge. Unfortunately, I don't think they have the practical application of it. And the the secret to being a strength coach is understanding how to adapt a program because you can have all the great knowledge in the world. But when that head football coach walks down and says, Hey, I know I have given you an hour and a half, but you're going to have to cut it down to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you got 30 minutes to change that workout. 
Now, you went from an absolutely perfect workout for an hour and a half. Now you got to come up with 45 minutes and it's got to be good. So how do you adapt that? Well, your time under the bar is what helps you understand what is valuable, what has to be accomplished and what has to be eliminated. You know, my buddy, Matt Wenning, do you know Matt Wenning? Oh yeah. Yeah. Matt said something really that hit me a couple of years ago. He said, by the time you have really a, a, a solid grasp of training and lifting, he goes, you've probably surpassed your own prime in competitiveness. <laughs> and I was like, wow, absolutely. And so, like you said, you start, you know, you mentioned the silver tundra. I started thinking to myself when I was a kid, anybody who I saw in the gym benching 315, they never had a spotter. They never grinded the reps. They never looked like they were killing themselves with intensity. Everything looked beautiful and clean clean reps. And yep. of course, when I was young, I'm thinking intensity, negatives, force negatives, drops. I was doing high volume with high intensity with, you know, a blend of all these things that just really I think, <laughs> destroys the body and halts you yeah. from yep. getting strong. So Bill, you know, if I look at your timeline of coaching, you began your first coaching position was at the early eighties. Yes. I, uh, I graduated from Liberty University. Yep. I, I was offered a job uh, in um, San Diego as a youth pastor. Okay. Um, and also, uh, I, I, when I went to uh, graduation, the founder of Liberty turned to me and said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm not sure. He goes, would you be interested in coaching? I said, yes, sir. I'd be very interested. Well, that was on a Sunday. Tuesday in Kansas City, guess who the two people that meet up together? The pastor of the church in San Diego and Jerry Falwell. And he goes, the pastor of the church in San Diego says, do you know Bill Gillespie? And Jerry says, yep, great young man. We're going to hire him to be our assistant track coach. <laughs> and so they hired another young uh, man to work with the young people there. And I became a track coach and uh, found out that uh, – you can have quite a ministry as a coach uh, over the years. So um, uh, I loved it. I loved it. I went, I didn't even know at that time there was such a thing as a strength coach. Right. That was a, I'm not sure what term they actually used for that position. I know that strength coaches began late sixties, early seventies, but I'm not sure. Did they call them a weight? a weights coach, a weightlifting coach? What did they describe? Well, most, of, most of the time it was a, a <clears throat> position coach Sport in coach. football yes. that had to do both. And so he was the, you know, in our situation, he was the linebacker coach and strength coach. And so uh, I thought that's how, if you wanted to work in the weight room, you had to be a football coach. Yeah. Well, I go on a trip after just getting married. Um, I come back and there's this gentleman standing in our weight room and I'm like, he's like, I'm like, excuse me, who are you? And he goes, hi, I'm Dave Williams. I'm the new strength coach. Oh, and he, he apologized to me for taking the job. And I'm like, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a strength coach. I, <laughs> and he was the head strength coach here at Texas A&M back in, uh, oh, that, wow. before that. And so I, um, I, I was just so eager to learn. And he just every day, all day, mentored me taught me what I you know so much about strength training and his impact on my life as a as a strength coach as a man a father husband it's just it's been huge well, how, and, how old uh, was he compared to you how old was Dave uh he is um let's see he is about uh eight I guess he's only about eight nine, nine uh yeah eight or nine years older than I am and so when you guys met and you mentioned he taught you, taught you and mentored you, was that just like the workouts together and kind of talking in between sets or after workout? How, how did the mentorship actually work? Well, you know, yes. While we were working out, uh, before we took the teams through the workouts, after the workouts, while we were sitting outside, just eating our lunches together, yeah. you know, <laughs> just picking his brain, you know, just, right. just constantly, you know, and he, equipment companies used to bring equipment to him 
to have him look at it and say, all right, what do we do to make it better? You know, I was going to ask you, Bill, you know, in the eighties, the universal machine, universal machines were big. I think York barbell was uh, probably the prime free weight distributor in our country, but there were some of these kind of, um, I don't know, like satellite places that regionally built equipment and, you know, Nautilus Nautilus was kind of, I don't know, in, maybe out. Interesting. So what was the equipment that you guys used? We were, we were all almost all free weights at that time. Um, and we, we did do cleans. We were, it was, it was back then it was extremely rare in the early eighties that anybody did cleans. Uh, bumper plates? Uh, a, a very few. Some the, of the, York. I have the original Yorks that is steel or I'm not sure if it's, but the bumper around it. Yes, exactly. Exactly what we had. Yeah. Well, they but. say that the guys were very strong, especially the York guys because their gym was on the second floor and they couldn't drop the weight. So they had to constantly control the eccentric. (laughs) There's a, that's that, that I wish more people understood that if they, uh, particularly on the deadlift, people pick up that weight all the time and just drop it. I'm like, why, why aren't you working the eccentric load? I know you don't have to do it in a competition, but if you want to learn perfect pulling position, bring the bar down slow. And then let it hover about half inch off the floor. You know, it just forces you to sit in perfect position. Morning now, if you want to take it, always yeah. If you, if you want to take it to the next level, take it and put have them stand on a K board. All right, oh, the board that K board. It's a board that tilts forward and backwards. Okay. And you uh, it has like a two by four running underneath it. And you just stand on it. This is what we use to teach our uh, players the first pull of the clean. Still? Yeah. What's it called? A K-board? Yeah. I've seen the wobble boards. By a yeah. This keyboard. That's okay. Very cool. Oh, um, that's old school, man. <laughs> I, this is great. So who made the uh, squat racks uh, in the 80s that you were using? Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had the old staircase squat racks. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that were like, I swear, twelve feet long. Yeah, and you had to walk all the way out with That's that. Right. You know, Several all, steps. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. And but you go to a meet and you're like, oh, I only got to take a couple steps back. You know, this yeah. is cool. Yeah, but we, yeah, we. That's what we had for a long time, and That's then we figured cool. out that if we set them up right we could stand up with the weight move our feet and then move the just slide them you know so we didn't didn't even have to walk out with them Uh, so funny so when you were doing cleans who was kind of your was dave a uh expert in all kind of weightlifting powerlifting everything so he taught you how to do the cleans yes sir yeah taught him well uh, he just learned from reading all the magazines and and doing it (laughs) <laughs> anybody and everybody that listened that he could you know because it you know you had you basically that was your really your only source of information is if you could find somebody who knew what they were talking about right and then pick their brain you know and of course and if you put your time under the bar then you quickly would recognize okay this guy's full of crap or wow wait a minute this guy really knows what he's talking about. And so then you knew whether or not you're getting good information. But, you know, it used to be so frustrating um, because coaches, football coaches, fall for this all the time. Um, the high intensity training. Yeah, that was popular okay. with. It was real popular. Mike Mincer, the machines. Yeah, yeah kid, you know, the guys are puking. You know, oh, yeah, 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 we got that guy, okay? But the problem was... The problem <laughs> that is was, true. Yeah, you know, so so if you weren't doing high-intensity training, then maybe your program wasn't intense enough, you know? And then, then functional training came around, you know? The late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I got pretty sick of all this stuff. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own training philosophy, call it championship training. And if you're not doing championship training, then you're not training to win championships, you know? I love it. <laughs> so, because I, it, 
it's just so people so quickly label whatever you're doing if it's not functional training then it must not be functional you know it's not part of and that's just not true you know and young strength coaches they, they a lot of times they buy into all this stuff and what we're seeing as a master strength coach myself and some of the other uh, uh, very well-known strength coaches is that we take these young strength coaches through their certification test and they'll go and try to explain to us, tell us that the only strength movement they're doing with a volleyball player is a pistol squat. And I'm like, "With you use weight? No, no. Uh -uh." I'm like, are you freaking kidding? You know, we're not supposed to say anything right. during the test, you know, just ask them the questions. But I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? You know, and, and I'm like, I'm starting to wonder, am I a dinosaur? You know, am I not adapting? But then I'm standing out afterwards and I, and some of the other strength coaches looked at me and they said, wow, I think our generation of young strength coaches have forgotten our, how, how to develop strength. And like Louis said, <laughs> pe people say all the time, <clears throat> You know, well, you know, obviously you don't need to be as strong as like me. Okay. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a really funny story. I mean, I'm going I'm to go off here. I got this. I love I it. I was coaching with the Seahawks. Okay. Yep. I was 330 pounds benching 800 pounds in competition. Sean Alexander and Heath Evans comes up to me in the middle of the season. <laughs> they said, coach, we need you to play this Sunday. And I laughed. I said, <laughs> I said, guys. I'm, I'm like 41 years old. All right. You know, leave me alone. Don't stop making fun of me. They said, you're a coach. You're a year older than Jerry. Jerry Rice on the team was on wow. the team. And I said, okay. And they said, our, our nose guards in a wheelchair. There's no chance of him playing this Sunday and we need you. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. No, you guys are serious. They said, coach, all you gotta do is grab a hold of two guys and hold on. I said, <laughs> I said, for how many plays? They said four or four or five. I said, in a row? <laughs> and they're like, no. but here's the this is the funny part about it, is is I meant I mentioned 800 pounds, and they said they're gonna go tell, tell Coach Holgram that I should play, and Coach Holgram never asked me to play. So either yeah. you need to bench more than 800 or an 800 pound bench press isn't necessarily applicable to be a football player. That's so funny. You know? So um. <laughs> That's, but, that story reminds me, Coach Reeve was telling me when he was at Wake Forest, they had an offensive lineman who, who was drafted by the Seahawks. And he told me that Coach Reeve would do a one-arm dumbbell bench. He said the guy would do 150s for 10 like this, no problem. I don't remember the name of the guy or what the year was. was strong, I, 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 but very strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Louie told me, he said, he said, we, we forget that, you have to the under the foundation of athletics is you got to be strong. Yes. And he says, he said, and speed people say, you know, I just want to work on getting faster. Well, mm -hmm. he says this, Louis says to me, he says, why does a man run faster than a woman? Because they're stronger. Right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, and it's, it's, it's not, like a powerlifting strong it's a functional type of strength that's applicable to the sport yes. and i i train all my athletes to be as powerful as possible and what i did was now i had a lot of great cleans when i was coaching at liberty uh one year we had 83 football players at a one double a school clean 300 or more i saw those videos bill and it honestly blew my mind you had skill guys like destroying three plates. Oh, and I remember that. so fast. And some guys did a full clean. Some guys did a muscle clean. And I remember watching that saying, I wonder if coach Gillespie said, if a kid said, coach, my wrists, my this. And you said, Hey, maybe you just do a muscle clean something that maybe, you know, a younger coach wouldn't understand, but I saw the speed at which your guys were squatting they'd come up and the bar would like fly off their traps. Yeah. Speed. Yeah. Because we, 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 we didn't, we did a one rep max, but we did the one rep max with the Tendo at 0.60 meters. It. Per yeah. If it wasn't fast, it's not applicable. And I never cleaned heavy in the, in a workout. Ever. I've heard this story of, or I've heard you talk about this, which yes. can you get into this? Like you mentioned 
you know, not cleaning heavy, but also you said, I didn't, what did you just say? It's, if it was a one rep max, it had to be fast. With the squat. Yeah. The squat. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah what, it had to be fast. what if they grinded it out? Urgh. Then what do you say? What do you say? You're done. You're done. What if like at a guy like me, I'm at a high school. So I have my private facility and I'm in the, I'm in a high school and uh, we haven't tested yet. But the thing I'm constantly hammering home is that I've, I tell, I share stories. Say the strongest, most explosive athletes, they don't grind reps. It's too heavy. It's got to look beautiful. Got to be fast. So what, you know, um, when you would program at, from what I saw at Liberty, how did you get them to choose their weights? Was it some sort of uh, preset weight that they did with percents or that you let them feel it out? No, it was, uh, it was a, a system I developed um, with the use of the Tendo unit. And I would regulate their speed based off of uh, how they performed the week before. Oh. And so like, um, let's say our workouts, you had to do six sets of two with a one minute turnover at 0.80 meters per second. All right. It, and what they did is they simply had uh, a 12 slots on their piece of paper. So every time they made uh, were successful at 0.80 or faster, they put a, a check on there. Okay. If they didn't make it, they put it like a zero. Uh -huh. And so then I would use a percentage. So I, I, I would go like this. I can, I can do this pretty quickly off the top of my head. Uh, if they were 100%, they got to go up, I think it was 15 pounds the next week. Total. All right. Yeah. From the, the week before, mm -hmm. if they were at 20 at 75% or higher, they got to go up 10 pounds. If they were 50% or higher, uh, then they got to go up five pounds. If they were, uh, less than 50% down to 25%, they went down five pounds. And if they went down 25% or less, they went down 10 pounds. So there was no staying the same. You either went it. up, yeah. or you went down and that, that to me is the best use of technology i've heard ever Be yeah. because some people are using it but you're going by you know we talk about speed they're moving another object which is what is needed in these combative sports football wrestling that if it's not fast then you adjust and go this percent that's a that's a lot of work too bill a lot of work for you guys as a staff yeah. Well, yeah, but, you know, I had a great staff that really you yes. know, understood the, the value of it. But we really valued getting stronger in season. All right. It. You know, I, I, and I used to think that that was impossible. Uh, but after working uh, at the Seahawks, I realized it had to happen. Right. And my last two years at Liberty, our guys were stronger on every exercise significantly than what they were in July when they did the preseason testing. Yeah. And, and we took nothing away from their energy during the season and, uh, and their game practice and game preparation. In fact, it enhanced their game practice. How, what was the lift? You know, um, I'm not sure what conference you were in. What did you guys play on Saturdays, right? College football yeah. Saturday. So yeah. what in season, what day, what did the weekly training slash lift schedule look like? Well, what we did is we lifted on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. What okay? was Sunday? Sunday, we had 30 minutes. Wow. All right. And because it, it, you're forced into doing this, and our players got used to where they could do this. But that was our, our let's say, I want to use a quotation, our heavy squat day. Interesting. Okay? The day after a game is heavy squat day. Yes. But awesome. remember now, it's all relative based off of the speed of the movement. All right. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and then we benched and then we did like a, a some po posterior uh, maybe a snatch grip deadlift or something like that. On Sunday or bench yeah. was Tuesday. Oh, sun, so no, Sunday's a full body. Every day. Every day is a whole body. Bench okay. and then posterior. 
Yes. And what what kind of bench was it? A speed day or? No, I never did a real. I did some speed days. In fact, in fact, I have a video somewhere uh, on my phone where I had the players, the linemen, did five sets of two mm-hmm. at about sixty percent. And I had this took quite a while to get them to where they could do this. Okay, and they had to spot each other, and they finished the workout in less than sixty seconds. Oh, they finished five sets of two. Yes. Oh, Them total their- amount of work, meaning you do your five, meaning if I time you in your five sets total, it's less than 60 seconds. Is that what you mean? Yes. I, I took you and your partner. Okay. You had to go. Then your partner had to go. You had to oh, change the weight. Goodness. Oh, it's, it was incredible. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's, a, just a, it's a thing of beauty. You know, and, and what's what's crazy was I was told I didn't quite understand how to condition guys for the up tempo offense, and I just laughed. I'm like, you have no clue what we were able to accomplish as far as conditioning for particular defense and uh, up tempo offense, and getting guys conditioned to do their workouts you know we think that just running is conditioning and i i use this uh, analogy all the time is at liberty back uh, you know 10 plus years ago we had two individuals that won three division one national championships in cross country right the best cross country runners and they could run all day right so if you took one of those guys and I had a conditioning contest against uh, with my fattest, nastiest looking offensive lineman, everybody would probably put their money on the distance runner, all right? But the conditioning contest is moving 250 pound boxes. Now that, that, that cross country runner, he ain't gonna move a box. Right. He ain't gonna budge a box. That big, fat, nasty looking offensive lineman, he's gonna move those boxes. And guess what he does for what we have to condition him for? We've got to condition him to move 250 pound box. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when you're in the <clears throat> weight room, you know, while I was able to accomplish huge numbers of strength, there was never a time where there was just an emphasis on strength development. I actually held the guys back from being as strong as they could have been because we did all our workouts with very short rest intervals. Um, they, I didn't give them very much time between sets. And it was part of the conditioning of, uh, effect of preparing with a football team. What did um, <clears throat> Tuesday and Thursday look like, Bill? Okay, Tuesday, Tuesday and Thursday, because those were harder practices day, but Tuesday was a hard practice day. Then I had to go a little bit lighter and I'm trying to remember, you know, that, that was definitely like uh, uh, probably our power clean day because I did cleans from the floor, from the hang, and e- even sometimes from the hang below the knee, which is probably my favorite. I right? like that too. Yeah. With people listening, the Instagram page that your staff had put together, I think was called something like Savage Strength Squad. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what did yeah. the t-shirts look like for you guys so you did cleans on tuesday what else would you follow up with cleans well you know i would find like i, I gotta i started it's, it's been a couple of years so it's hard for me to remember everything that okay. we did sure but it would you know and, and it would it would be somewhat it would change somewhat through the season all right, all right. uh but it would always be whole body i uh-huh. I, I learned a long time ago that you know, no football player is going to go out to football practice and ask the coach, is today's football practice an upper body or lower body day? Yeah, it's interesting when <clears throat> kids are like, hey, can I uh, lay low on my legs? Da, da, da. I go, listen, you know, when you play football, you have five days practice, and then a game day. You run on Monday. Do you tell mm-hmm. the coach that you can't run to? You're running every day. You have to build up your not just your physical ability but the mental aspect of training your body to be strong and i know the word gets thrown around a lot but you need to be tough you know you can't be so um sensitive that you're a little bit sore work capacity is the key okay yeah i was in i was in budapest for the ipf world championships that were all the lifters are on the same bus and they asked me 
because I was one of the older guys there. I'm always seems like I'm the oldest guy around lifting. And they asked me, they said, uh, how many times do you bench a week? And I said, three. They said, are they all heavy? I said, pretty much, yeah. And they go, and I thought, okay, they'll be impressed with that. And I says, then they asked me, how long have you been doing that? And I says, I'm a really surprised. I said, I've been doing that for years. And they looked at me and they said, so how long has your bench been stuck? And I'm like, oh, how do you know that? And they said, because you can only do X amount of work within a workout and you're going to start to overtrain. Okay. It's just, that's how it is. No matter how good a shape you get in. The secret is you have to add dates. When I was coming out of high school, I was a, a hod carrier. The first three weeks, man, the old, the old drunks would wear me out. But and after you, three weeks, what were you a what carrier? A hod carrier, uh, carrying bricks <clears throat> or a bricklayer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it wore me out. I couldn't even eat. I hardly eat, could eat dinner that night. I could take <laughs> eat dinner, take a shower, and went right to bed. I was exhausted. How you old, know, how old were then, you with, with that? Uh, that was like the late 70s. Can and they were paying me a whole $5 an hour. You know, so I'm thinking, hey, I'm not going to, you know, I know that sound doesn't seem like nothing now, but, but it was. That was a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money. And I'm like, I'm not going to call in and say, hey, I'm overtrained. You know, it'd be embarrassing. Right. Uh, so, but after three weeks, your body adapts to the workload. <clears throat> and the same thing's true. So what we do, we go, we get these fresh bodies, and that fresh body is the most precious commodity that you can have. And what we do is we take it and annihilate it. Unfortunately, I see too many times. And then three weeks later, the kids just there's nothing left of them. The trick is to develop that work capacity and start slow and build up. And as soon as you want to put light weight on the bar, everybody wants to go and do high reps. Why? I never, I don't understand that. When you, the, the Bulgarians back in the 80s came out with an article that said that if you have a joint injury and you're recovering from the joint injury the best thing you can do is to start back with lightweight obviously and do one to three repetitions that's interesting but there's not a lot of blood flow with the one to three reps but <laughs> you're trying to strengthen the joint mm -hmm. okay and and what we found was I started developing this into a training technique. I had a young man at the University of Washington. His name's Eric Bjornsson. I hope you don't mind me using his name. But this guy was a quarterback. Then they moved him to wide receiver. And he was injured. And at the University of Washington, you had to get a personal record or you had to go meet with the, new, uh, with the head football coach and explain to him why you didn't. Right. Okay? So even if you're injured, you had to explain to him. So he comes in and he had to start with six sets of two at 135 on the squat. Okay. After uh, uh, what was seven weeks of training, we got him to 365 for six sets of two and gradually introduced assistant exercises to his training. Max day comes up. His personal max is 465 at that time. He just toyed with 475. He said, I'm going to 500. I said, yeah, no joke. Put 500, bam, did it so easy. I'm sitting there going, this sucker could do 600. He turns to me and goes, I'm going to 600. I'm like, all right. He put 600 pounds on the bar and got it. Now, here's what's so cool about this, okay? Because he was willing to do that, he goes to the combine, never played tight end, and told the Cowboys, Hey, I'm built just like you're tied in. I squatted 600 pounds. I could play tight end for you. They go, he, they go, who's your strength coach? He says, Bill Gillespie took me through it. He said, we're going to verify because Bill don't, Bill, 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 Bill don't play no jokes. He'll, he'll tell us the truth. And he ended up getting drafted in the fourth round by the Cowboys back in the 90s. Won two Super Bowls and still wearing a ring because of it. They were Cowboys were crushing it right back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So this young man, you know, we, that's when I started to go, okay, this thing works. Okay. This whole philosophy of developing the work capacity, just think about this. If you, I'm going to do the math really quickly. Okay. If I do five sets of two with a hundred pounds, that seems like a joke. All right. But that's 10 reps with 100 pounds. That's 1,000 pounds more than you lifted the day before. Correct. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to develop that tonnage. And so that's just one of the methods that you can use to develop your work capacity. The other method is to go and say, all right, so I'm going to do a two-minute turnover. And this is what we did during training camp is we would do weekly the same routine, but we would shorten the turnovers so that by the time the season started our players were so used to doing the workouts in such a short turnover right. that it complemented what we were doing on the football field and we could get more work done with a limited amount of time because i only had 30 minutes on sunday 45 on um, <clears throat> tuesday and 35 minutes on thursday to take them through the workout and on thursday's workout by the way was a lot of uh, we had a little we did some light weights, but we did um, a band circuit for uh, to activate the CNS to get so them fired up. And the players like scored fast, they, fast yeah, they, band stuff. What? Well, so yeah. I I have like Thursday. So Thursday was no weights, or it was there like was weights. No dumbbells. We know we, 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 we do. They'd be like hand cleans. Okay, um, more cleans. Yeah, some more bench pressing, but it was not very, it was not taxing. And then we do this band circuit. Like what would um, you do? Good mornings, chest press, row? Uh, with the bands? Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, we called them fire outs. It was one of the main ones. Uh, we had uh, on the Sornex platforms that we had, had an angle plate at the back. And we took skateboarding tape and we put it on there. And then you attach the bands to the rack, crisscross them across your shoulders. And then you get like you're coming off the line yeah. and you're just firing out. You're using like the blue bands and you're just <clears throat> lunging, teaching your body yes. to throw the hips out and uh, the hips through and lunge out. Like what uh, they now could use on the jammer arm. Yes. But exactly. the band, interestingly enough, Bill, uh, so I have the jammers at one of my locations and I'm getting uh, new racks at my hometown location with Sorenex. Uh, but I do the bands on the jammer arm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, interesting, like when you talk of the way you're training and what you learned, um, I, I feel like if, if an athlete gets mentored early years with this kind of speed strength style training, that you know, I don't want to, you know, quote, you know, but your championship training style, it can change not the physical only, but also the mental because of how they feel. I could only imagine the confidence you get from that training. Whereas for me, I always explain to, to other coaches and even the kids, <clears throat> listen, I started in 89. I had flex and muscle and fitness fabricated you know i didn't i didn't come across powerlifting usa the pat there was a few powerlifters in our gym but they didn't really they were probably you know didn't really look like the kind of powerlifters that you and i have seen the powerful especially those guys of the 70s and 80s i mean you even look at wwf wrestling of the 80s those those wrestlers were powerlifters power bodybuilders they were strong and explosive and agile and so um yeah this training that you're talking about is quote unquote functional which that word kind of started getting thrown around heavily 99 2000 2002 um bill let me i want to backtrack something real quick as i was thinking about this you mentioned like when dave you know kind of was mentoring you what's interesting is back then you would never say hey um can i pick your brain for a cup of coffee you always would say can i come and train with you <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I don't yeah. under, somebody asked me like a couple months ago can i pick your brain for coffee and i said you know i don't want to sound like a jerk but i don't have time for a cup of coffee but if you come here 
you'll come here and train. You'll train yeah. with my athletes because what are you going to learn when I tell it to you? I need you to train and then listen to the things I'm saying. You know, you mentioned a lot of these, this kind of art of coaching. You know, this, um, when you squatted, I don't recall seeing you guys box squat uh, at Liberty, but you know, I'm only seeing some videos, but I always say, say this, what's interesting, Bill, is you learning from Louie in the early 80s, you know, almost 40 years ago, we are seeing division one strength coaches at major universities not box squatting correctly. They're not sitting, they sit down, they crash, or they do a touch go. They're not sitting back and pausing. And so maybe they don't know who Louie is, or they don't even, and same thing with the floor press. The floor press is like the box squat for the upper body. They don't know how to come in, you know, sit on eggshells, absorb. That, that's what's crazy is there's so much information. Don't you think so, Bill? There's so much information yet we're still, maybe we're not coaching great. We have the information. I could say it. I could put it in a PowerPoint when I'm at my job interview. But then what about, you know, commanding the room, you know, and doing these things you speak about. And so I think that's interesting how we learned or how people learn versus learning today. You learned by lifting and coaching and a lot of time under the bar and, uh, you know, boots on the ground. You know, I, I won't do online coaching. <clears throat> I won't. I, people ask me all the time. I'll pay you whatever you want to pay for uh, the coach to have you coach me on the bench press. And I'm like, I won't do it. I said, because you, I got to watch you bench press because it's so fluid in what we're doing. I want to see what you're doing. I want to correct what you're doing because you assume because this is how everybody else does it, that this is the right way to do it. And if I send you my workout, you're going to adapt it to that system and it's not going to work. Where I'm seeing 10 to 15% increases in the bench press by doing my routine, you know, in like 11 week program that I use. Because so you have to see what that person. See it. Needs. Yes. I, 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 it's, it's, you know, I'll tell you, Zach, what, I, man, I could go on and on and on. Uh, first thing I want to do say is that, is that the clean is a representation of the power of summation of the forces that you develop within your workout. All right. You're not trying to develop strength through the clean itself. Okay, uh, it's, it's, so when I got really great cleans, it means the rest of my programming is excellent. Okay, I got you. I, I want to get you on that. But second thing, we all know there has to be variations to the movement, or you're going to go stale. Okay, but here's I, don't, I can't believe I'm going to share this. Okay, but here's the biggest I think found. I, I it, it's simpler than dirt. Okay. <laughs> People make too big of variations and it becomes counterproductive, right? The variations that you make, you know, I always say, people ask, what's the most important exercise to develop your bench press? The bench press, okay? If you want to increase your bench press and you have to do a variation of the bench press, the closer the variation is, to what you need to do in the meet is the best ex assistant exercise you can do. A narrow grip bench is probably the best assistant exercise that you can do. Change the tempo. Change. I'm a big stickler on how you touch the chest. We take an, uh, to, I get a new guy and I put a piece of fettuccine on their chest. <laughs> and they got to come down and touch that fettuccine without breaking it. And, you know, at Liberty, you know, it's a Christian school. They're, they're not supposed to kiss girls, but they do, of course. But uh, so I go and I tell the guys, you know, hey, you know, I just celebrated uh, earlier this month uh, my 37th uh, wedding anniversary. And my wife is really successful, unbelievably beautiful. And I said, guys, I must be doing something right. Okay. So I'm going to teach you how to kiss a girl. Now, I know that some of you never kissed a girl. 
maybe some of you have. But we're and, and this only works for coaching guys, okay? Yeah. The, the women don't care. They must be them. laughing so hard at this. Yeah. But guys, I'm telling you, in the NFL, these guys will try to impress you. So I said, so what I want you to do for you guys that are experienced kissing a girl, you're going to do just excellent. Those guys that aren't, you're probably going to struggle a little bit on this. So what we want to do is when you kiss a girl, you got to be soft, gentle. Don't give her a bloody lip. <laughs> and, uh, and then just a small little kiss and pull away. And I says, so when you go to bench press, come down, touch that piece of fettuccine. Don't break it. Be soft and gentle. And then push the bar up. And, oh, my gosh. It, guys, music's blaring. And you can hear that little tiny piece of fettuccine snap. And you'll hear, ah, you know, it's, it's incredible. But if you want to develop true shoulder strength, not how much you can bench press, that'll come. But true shoulder strength, that's how you got to bench press for athletics. Because it forces you to stay on in control on the eccentric contraction. So your shoulder stays stable. You don't go and relax your shoulder joints so that it leads to shoulder injuries. I found a dramatic drop in shoulder injuries when I make the guys bench press this way. Yeah, okay, so they can't bench as much. What do I care? Because like I said, I benched 800, didn't get to play in the NFL. So what I want is I want strong shoulders. So by forcing them to bench this way, I'm developing strong shoulders. The other thing we we did is um, to keep their butts down. Stupid simple. You take a five foot piece of rope about the size, you know, a little thinner than my feet, my pinky, and you tie a five pound plate to it. You take the rope and you pull it across the bench where your butt is. When you go to do the lift, you put your butt on the rope and the five pound plate is hanging alongside the bench. If you pick your butt up, the weight falls on the floor. Right. Now, what you're doing is when you're picking up your butt or you're bouncing that thing off your chest, you're developing artificial acceleration off your chest. Yes, you can lift more, but just because you lift more, does that mean you're stronger? No. And what we're trying to do is develop functional strength for our athletes. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty picky about how the guys – I love this. Friend, you, know, you know, um, I, I have the private sector and then the high school and, uh, the football guys <clears throat> really, I, I feel like they don't like me because if you're not squatting all the way down, that's a no rep and you got to go lighter. If your butt is in the air and you're grinding all over the place on the bench, that is a no rep. And <clears throat> I feel like because it's, you know, interesting at the high school, it's not mandatory for them to show up and there's a, you know, a strength coach on every other corner, they can just go and train elsewhere. <clears throat> and I just find that's the, the mentality at that age is interesting is some athletes are not coachable. They just don't want to change. And I'm wondering, you must have come across that bill. You've been at, you were at the high school level. I, I know for a year, I think you've of course been collegiate and NFL what are some communication techniques that have helped you connect with a kid who may have struggled to be a good listener and coach? Okay. I'll tell you first and foremost is that uh, unlike what you would think um, out of high school, small college, major college, NFL, the most cooperative athlete to coach is an NFL player. Interesting. They'll do it. They'll do exactly what you tell them to do because you're going to help them make more money by getting let them play more years. And they know that their body is what got them there. The, the worst group to work with is small college. They think they're really good and they're going to pretend like they're really good because they've got that false, you know, arrogance because they, you know, they're, they're good, but they're not really that good. What small college? Um, Do you want double A? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're the hardest to work, but <clears throat> also can be your most rewarding level because I think the best strength coaches are at the one double A level because they're good and you got to get them over the top. 
And there's usually, you know, I, I, I did a, a, a motivational talk about recently about uh, uh, how that uh, you could be one screw loose from being a Cadillac, you know, and all that's all it takes is to have one screw loose it keeps you from becoming in everything you you want to be in, you know, and, and at the one double A, it might be five or six screws versus at the FBS school where there's only like one, maybe one or none. Right. And, you know, it's fun to get those guys with none, but as a strength coach, we got to be able to figure out why is it you, you know, we had a young man come to Liberty offered no scholarships. And they told me that he wasn't very, he wasn't fast enough. I said, we well, fast straight ahead. Right. He said, Oh yeah. And I says, well, it's because his hips are too tight, you know? And, and that, in fact, that's another thing that, Oh my gosh, this is a whole other topic. Um, hips when you see a lot of hamstring problems that could be from work capacity or lower back problems it's because this generation has developed bad hips and i thought i thought it was a small college thing but as i talked to some of my friends in the nfl they said they were facing the same situation is it from sitting bill all the sitting all the sitting yes and so their ability what they do is is they overuse the hamstrings and lower back because their inability to use the hips correctly, the they, they, they glute activation, and they don't use it. So they compensate with the lower back and hamstrings way too much. And obviously, if you're not using your glutes, then you're not as effective as an athlete. You can't, you know, you're not going to run as fast. You can't, you can't, you can't be as powerful because the hips. The kips are the most important. Uh, how did you correct some of those uh, imbalances and weaknesses? We <clears throat> we, we, did, we we started doing some. Um, uh, uh, we would take the lacrosse ball, have them lay on their side, and have a partner uh, driving into the hip while they. I'm just gonna really do it. This is almost as simplistic as I get. While the lower leg stays straight, the upper leg would move forward and back, up and down. Um, to loosen up the hips mm-hmm. and then and then we did a pre- before every workout we did a pre-activation uh, routine for the glutes which included like a single leg dumbbell uh, straight leg down up oh yeah that's a tough yeah. one great yeah. one yep. yeah yeah and so we found that these what what i had some great assistants and they would come to me and they said coach I have this great routine that's going to help us solve this problem, but it's going to take 45 minutes. I was like, I don't have 45 minutes. You got seven minutes. They said, well, it's impossible. I said, figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, they come back to me two weeks later and say, or whatever. And they say, coach, we got it down. We got to the, you know, I, I don't like duplication of effort in my workout. So I don't want to go do something that's going to have, to, we're going to be doing something similar or on the football field. Right. I don't really right. waste time and energy. So I would have them figure out a routine, you know, that we could do in like seven minutes. And then we would rehearse it as a staff over and over and over and over. So we knew it inside and out. Then we introduced it to the players. So it would get, we, we always looked like we were, well tuned our players knew exactly what to do and that built confidence of what we're doing now when you talk um i'll tell you one thing also when you're talking about getting your players to buy in yeah always talk about safety and i know that doesn't seem that you're like well of course we need to be talking about safety. i make a huge issue about spotters collar all yes It's, it's it's beyond just for their safety but I want them to hear out of my mouth, I care about their safety. So when I ask them to do something, they don't think I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. They're going to go, wait a minute, this guy, all he does is talk about my safety. Now he's going to ask me so- to do something that I think is crazy. But I know this guy, all he cares about is my safety. Right. So huge coaching tip right there. Huge. Right. Um, Bill, you know, with your decades of coaching and kind of how I've seen, you know, the 80s was so much bodybuilding information because of the movies, Arnold and Sly with Rocky and all the action movies. Then the 90s was kind of like a strange time. Bodybuilding was like, you know, fitness magazines came out. Then early 2000s was CrossFit plus functional training and God forbid you squat like, you know, you're the devil. 
then you know with crossfit olympic lifting actually then the information became more readily available did you ever find feel like you lost your way as a coach maybe you you tried something a little different and then you're like ah oh, we never should have gone that route did you ever feel like you stumbled i did that as an athlete mm-hmm. i went into my um fourth year of college i went to the uh, small college national championships in the in track and field and i was winning the national championship in the shot put to the second to the last throw got beat and finished second in the nation okay my fifth year of college, I come back to the outdoor season and I, I work at this place that had a, a, a Nautilus Center. And all I heard about was how incredible these machines would be to make you strong and powerful. And I bit into it. And I went from being a 60 foot shot putter to a 51 foot shot putter. All right. Lost nine feet. Now, during that same time, there was a kid from a small school that was a 37 foot shot putter and his coach had been to Russia and introduced Olympic lifting to him. He went from 37 to 49 feet. So think about it. He was at 37 feet the year before I was at 60 feet. Now we're two feet apart because of training methods. Right back then. The gyms were oftentimes all machines and yeah, maybe some fixed barbells, you know, for curling. Yeah. No platforms. That's so right. man, I, I, I found, I got into the uh, university weight room in the at two in the morning and I started doing cleans. I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I'm going back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, the nineties, a lot of these universities were hit uh, training hit, tra- you know, high intensity. Uh, one of the kids I train, his dad played football at Penn state. He coaches in the NFL and there's, a, he goes, there's a video of my dad training in the nineties. And we look it up and his dad's going through like the one all out set on the, on the Nautilus machines. Maybe they were hammer strength. Um, and I was like, yeah, wow. He was at Penn state, which was a hit school. Mm-hmm. Well, let me tell you this in 2002, We had our first collegiate strength and conditioning coaches meeting, and there were several coaches that were there from the uh, CSCCA. CSCCA. And there were several there that were hit coaches. Right. And nobody would talk to them. I purposely, (laughs) (laughs) I purposely went over and asked, Can I eat dinner with you? Uh And they looked at me kind of funny, like, You're not a hit guy. I said, I know I'm not a hit guy, but. It's not like there aren't parts of my programming that don't include some type of hit training. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're doing something right on that part of the training. I may not agree with you and you may not agree with me, but I want to learn what you're doing right. so I can understand how I can apply that when I need to. Does that make sense? Yeah, I remember Coach Reeves saying this to me. You know, he was probably my earliest mentor in this field. And he said that <clears throat> we use powerlifting. We use weightlifting. We use kettlebells. He goes, sometimes we do high-intensity training. It's at the end of a workout. You got to do one all-out set of pull-ups and dips or one all-out set of barbell curls. He goes, there's that time and place. and And I still feel those things like sometimes you know uh you know i i blend the powerlifting the weightlifting the kettlebells the strongman stuff um it's always strange to me when somebody believes that there's just one way this is the only way i think you know 20 30 years ago maybe athletes would never question a coach you could be a one-way kind of guy but now the athletes are very inquisitive and you need to connect with them in a much deeper level. And, you know, I remember at my experiences at the collegiate level, somebody might be doing heavier box squats. Another kid, he didn't believe in heavy lifting. So I would say, listen, add weight one time after your warm up and just do speed. Cause if he went heavy, it messed with his confidence. And like, you know, you're, 
kind of have these multiple things happening under the same roof. So, um, and I think in the off season, some machines and putting on doing some bodybuilding work, or let's say I, I was training the wrestling team. If a heavyweight can't do pull-ups, I would say you're going to do one pull-up and then go to the lap pull down machine and do eight reps. <laughs> you're going to do one and eight, one and eight. You're pulling. And I stopped getting so, um, you know, rigid about what exactly they did. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I learned that through, through the years. So, um, yeah. um, Bill, what do, would you like to close out on any topic or, you know, now that you're doing these educations, you're with Sorenex, you're consulting, going in and speaking to university staffs. Are there any questions that you want them to ask, but they're consistently not asking? Like, uh, you're like, why don't they ask me about, you know, <laughs> X, Y, Z kind of like, can I pick your brain with coffee when it should really be, can I bench with you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, um, no, I, I just, uh, I, I think that people uh, need to understand the application of what they're doing, okay? You have these tools, okay? If, I, if my wife says, I need you to hang a picture, I can't find a hammer. I can, get a, I can get a crescent wrench and use that for a hammer, right? But I, I would never use that crescent wrench to build a house. Right. Yeah, I can do. I can drive a nail with it, but I'm not going to build a house with it. It's not the tool for the job. In fact, I probably wouldn't use a hammer. I'd probably use an air gun because that's the best tool for the job. And I'm always looking ergonomically. What is the most effective tool to get the job done? understand what our tools are, understand our time limitations of what we have and what we have to accomplish, and then make the uh, best application of your time. Uh, I, I've been visiting some gyms here while I'm out here in Texas getting in some workouts, and I tell them about the back attack. Yeah. I love the back attack. I absolutely love it. Which and Soren is I, built in the 90s, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if, you take, if you take the reverse hyper, and the glue ham rays, combine it together and how much we use it, we use the back attack more than those two put together. Who's we at the university? At, so at Liberty. When how, I was many, at Liberty. how many did you have? Six. It's. I have not seen too many people use the back. You see their Franken hyper being used a lot. Yeah. No, just that was mm. the cornerstone of our training because Training that posterior chain with a back attack made my guys powerful. I it, and what it did was it, it you know it eliminated duplication of work, gave me more time, more energy to allow my players to do other exercises because the back attack covered so many things that I needed to get done. Yeah. I am a huge, huge I do the back attack. For my bench press because if i get my butt a little bit bigger i can hurt a little bit higher and yeah, i change my leverage on my bench press for that simple reason alone well, you know um, bill now that you mentioned the back attack i'm and just looking at your program did you guys trap our deadlift or sumo deadlift snatch grip deadlift snap because you're huge fan with, with your uh early knowledge of uh, west side you know uh, he does. I don't know if in the eighties he was encouraging it, but certainly once the two thousands, twenty tens came along, Louis spoke a lot about a sumo deadlift being safer. So you went, that's right. Snatch grip. Why snatch grip deadlift? Charles Poliquin said the number one exercise for developing speed is the snatch grip deadlift. Why? Because of the lats and getting low. You're getting low, forcing the hips to bend. That's why when people ask me for years, Tell me one secret, squat two inches below parallel. Because that's when the hips are getting activated. And that's the key to the squat is the hips. What about, um, you know, looking at that old Instagram account? I don't recall seeing box squats. Did you not box squat? We had a difficult time at Washington. We did. I had a difficult time getting the box squats set up. I love box squats. And I did them, you know, very similar to how Louis do. I didn't do the touch and go. I think that's yeah. crazy. Um, but for starting strength, huge, incredible what it'll do for you. But the same thing with the snatch grip. The, um, 
I'll tell you another exercise that I absolutely loved was um, the Tendo deadlift. I found that for evaluating football players, yeah. I never found an exercise that would be so glaring in the differences between the good and the great. We had, we, what, we would like do the technique of it or their speed, the speed their ability to perform it at the speed. We would do it <clears> at <throat> 0.8 uh, meters per second or 0.9 meters per second in A season. Con conventional deadlift. Yes. Overhand and or did you have them hook grip? I don't even know. You know, looking at your guys when they did heavy cleans, I don't think they hook gripped. No, no. A lot of them wore straps or just, oh, yeah. Or they were just strong. They were just strong. <laughs> yeah, they would just grab the bar with an overhand grip. Yeah. But we had a defensive lineman, two defensive linemen, uh, pull 500 pounds for twos in season uh, on the Tendo deadlift. And I'm like, I, I told them, I said, guys, I'm really nervous about you pulling 500 pounds. And they said, coach, we can't feel it. It's so light. And I'm just like, yeah. And then I realized what I felt like when I pulled, you know, the deadlift at 0 0.80. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I can't feel it either. But then we'd have these other guys who swore up and down. They could hit real hard. And they had, they couldn't do more, more than 225. Yeah. Isn't that weird is were those guys who, um, you know, we're not lit or sometimes guys could lift heavy, but they're not fast. They're often like, I call that you're strong and useless. So yeah. you must have been really, you know, heavily using Tendo. Um, yeah. That's a lot. Those are uh, quite expensive to have. I don't How many would you have in, in that weight room? <laughs> well, we had uh, 24 platforms and we had with broken ones, close to 40 tendos. <laughs> and then we would constantly, after almost every workout, we would be like reconditioning tendos to make sure that we had at least, you know, one for every platform and then a few others for substitutes in case there was a problem. Yeah. Now they have different, um, they don't have, ten, I mean, of course the tendos available, but there's like, you could slide something on the bar. I'm not sure if it's as accurate. And there's also, um, Rutgers might have it. You're squatting and it has like an iPad. And when you squat, it shows your speed. Yeah, we we defunct that one in about 10 seconds. Really? I forget what it's called. Well, it was, it was a different company, but my assistant says, All right, let's uh let's give this thing a try. First thing he did was he stood up behind the guy and was spotting him. And it said it wouldn't give him a start signal. And he goes, well, you got to step back. He says, so you're going to tell me I can't spot my guys? And it was uh, the, the, the guy was like, uh. Then the second thing he did is he squatted down really slow, came up really slow. And at the very end, he threw his head up really fast. And, and they it, gave, it, it gave him a big speed. Score. See, yeah. I guess my concern with those softwares is sometimes the person behind it has not done thousands how many times do you think you've benched? How many? Oh, gaz yeah. so, yeah. Right, a gazillion. And so I overheard a coach say, hey, I like that because, uh, you know, Bill sees that he squatted, you know, whatever, 0.80, you know, meters a second. Zach did 0.86. And so then, you know, Bill gets, uh, Zach hears Bill's like, you know, bell go. So now the coach said, I don't have to shout and coach as much. And I don't think shouting is, you know, a bad thing. I, I get it. Some of the coaches today are just kind of cheerleading, but I think you have to coach. You have to be able to say, listen, that squat was fast, but I saw your right knee cave in a hair. So I want you to move your feet apart one inch or, yeah. uh, you know, Hey, John, when you were squatting, your elbows are back. You're pointing back at me. I need you to get your elbows under the bar. So don't go heavier on this set. But instead the coach sees that the software said this amount of speed, that means you could go heavier. And then they're missing like what you said earlier, those nuances that I imagine also as a sport coach, they, you know, you think about um, 
I don't follow football enough, but you obviously got like, you know, Nick Saban at Alabama or any of these coaches who've been around for a while, they see stuff that a computer cannot, you know? And so it's the, um, I don't know if the art of coaching is the proper word or the coach's eye is really where you can't replace, you know, um, interesting stuff, Bill, this has been, yeah. You know, when I was with the Seahawks, we had yeah. three wide receivers on the practice squad. Mm -hmm. And we put um, um, 110 kilos on the bar, and we did uh, sets of twos. And we wanted to see who could move the bar the fastest on the power clean. Okay. And uh, we had two studs, okay, studs. And one guy, he wasn't, he wasn't as physical as the other two. And when they started doing the cleans, the guy that wasn't as physical was annihilating them. Okay. He was moving the bar way faster and I'm <laughs> giggling. Okay. Cause I wanted, I, I, I knew that those two other two were getting mad. They're very competitive. That's right. the, that's the, by the way, that's the thing that separates the NFL players is their, is their competitiveness. Okay. They're not afraid to compete. And if, if you want to play in the NFL, number one, you got to be competitive. No, number one all right um but what we did was after a while they were frustrated and it allowed me to step in and go let me correct something for you guys all right i said you two are stomping when you do your cleans i'll tell you what as fast as you are i'll race you any day and beat you if you don't touch your feet on the ground and they looked at me and they looked at me kind of funny i said when you stomp and your feet aren't on the ground, you are no longer applying force to the ground. So the bar stops moving vertically. If you, stop, if you keep your feet on the ground, you will continue to apply force to the ground and you'll clean that weight faster. Well, they pulled that bar so fast, about busted their chin open because yeah. they, you know, they were used to it. Another trick to the clean is everybody thinks you got to coach the shrug. The shrug is to not elevate the bar up. The shrug is to pull an Olympic lifter under the bar. So what we, what we found was the, the arch between the shoulder blades would collapse and then it, you wouldn't be able to apply the hips correctly. And the clean is all about the application of the hips. So what we did is we would teach the clean by doing a pre-shrug. They would shrug the weight up, hold it, get their posture, and do the clean while in the shrug position. Drop under. When yeah. you taught the clean, were you teaching the full clean or or catch the power position? Oh, uh, we never we never allowed them to catch uh, uh, low. Uh, low, never. Right. Safety. Um, well, that and and I was trying to coach for vertical force and not just how much you could clean not the change of direction yeah i know i spoke with no, we did front. Yeah, he, yeah he said we did front thing. walks but we didn't yeah uh, yeah but I, I didn't i had too many kids who <sighs> you know at liberty we had a, a very short transition period and so like you know some schools you can you'll average four or five years getting to coach the kid at liberty you you averaged about two and a half years because of you'd lose kids transfers so you had a shorter window to develop them and have yeah. them play. So I couldn't go and teach them a squat clean and have everybody doing it safely to where I could allow them to do it on a test day. So I just said, not, right. no, I think some of the strength, I explained to my kids, you will do a full clean. If your strength coach is a purist of Olympic weightlifting and just, only believes and i don't see too many of them some of the coaches i see doing it and they really you know incorporate a system of making uh -huh. sure they do it right but i had a conversation with travis mash a while back and he said he goes i would just teach a power clean he goes maybe once in a blue moon you're gonna have this kid that just moves beautifully who's gonna naturally go under without you teaching him he said that's okay he goes, but if somebody's elbows are down and they catch it, you're breaking a wrist. And you so, are. Yeah. You know, he said, we said, yeah, just jump, throw, sprint to get that extension. Um, oh, I was going to ask you a last thing. Oh, um, so uh, 
<laughs> so, you know, you and I were both, you know, working with sore necks. You're, uh, I have a good friend of mine, Jesse Ackerman, who I know you've spoken of. <laughs> Jesse's, Jesse's the man. Love that guy. So, um, you know, uh, what, what do you want to, you know, how could people connect with you for what you're doing with sore necks? Are you essentially consulting with university departments or what other ways have, you know, unique ways have coaching staffs reached out to you aside of like, hey, come in and do q and I'm wondering how else they're utilizing trying to learn from you versus Q&A. Yeah, during the COVID, it was a lot of uh, Zoom. Zoom meetings, right. you know, I'm hoping now I can start getting back into uh, visiting more places. Uh, I, I, I ha- they, the Sornix has turned me loose and helped me write a zillion articles that they haven't released yet. I mean, I, I literally, I think I've wrote enough for a book. Um, make it a book then. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about doing it. Uh, but it, when I was at Liberty, I had been promised I had lifetime job security. I remember hearing this story. Yeah. yeah heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah it, 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 they didn't. I'm an alumni there, and I won't go into it because I'm very thankful to be where I am right now. And uh, I would have never benched. Uh, I don't think I would have benched over a thousand pounds if I had um, stayed in coaching because I was just working too many hours. Right. I didn't have time to train and recover. Bill, so, I mean, I'll, I, you know, I've done short stints in the college sector. And, I, you know, when people ask me about it, I go, it's heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking <laughs> that, <clears throat> you know, and I put this out there. So I'll just, you know, I, I let it fall on my shoulders as I say, what I see is big universities, just universities in general, not all, but many are investing in things, not people. And so they're going to have a multi, multi, multi million dollar facility. And then somebody with a master's degree, 20 plus years experience is going to make a below average salary. Whereas if you have a master's degree, 20 years experience in name another field, you're at the top. And so I hope, you know, and I've conversed with um, guys who are your age in the industry. So they've really seen all the, the different changes. And they say, there's nothing professional about our profession. They say it's a field. And to me, that's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. That's, that's uh, and I'll also say that it's, it's embarrassing that as an industry our own do it to ourselves and uh, the way things are handled. And a buddy of mine was getting a, or was, had signed a contract for an NFL. He had a lease on an apartment and like two weeks prior to leaving, they called him and said, we changed our mind. We got somebody else. And he said, the only guarantee in strength and conditioning is there are no guarantees. (laughs) And my response to all that is like, it's so heartbreaking because When people are going to listen to this episode and any other episode, they could feel our passion. You're, they could feel it where we love it so much. And, uh, that's, what's heartbreaking is that, um, we know that we could do a great job, but Hey, the next guy could take the job for 20,000 less, $20,000 less. And I say to myself, well, that weight room is, you know, $5 million, you know, you're telling me this coach can't get a $10,000 raise. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. And so I hope that changes. I don't know if what it would, if it will, you know, the, the, essentially the, the response to that is we outnumber the job opportunities. There's so many strength coaches more than there's jobs available. Very tricky. (laughs) I tell young strength coaches, do whatever you can do to avoid becoming a strength coach. Isn't that heartbreaking that you have to yeah. say that, Bill? And if you can, um, yeah, because it's just such a, it's, I, I, I was at a university, not Liberty, but a different university, which if you do the math, you'll figure out real fast where it was sure. at, where one of the coaches came to me and told me, he said, you better get it straight this is more important than your family and we expect you to divorce your wife and leave your kids to be able to get us to where we need. And I'm like, that'll never happen. That's right. But I promise you this, your team will be bigger, faster and stronger than you've ever seen before. And uh, fortunately for me, 
my wife is a professional. She supports me 100%. She stood through with me through thick and thin. And um, I, I know if I was in a foxhole, I'd want her right there next to me because she would fight to the death for me. And um, I don't say that lightly. Um, yeah. And for... She, she's a nasty fighter, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say the same about my wife. You know, my wife has seen me start out of my garage, out of my parents' garage. The first house we bought together, the first thing that was fixed was the two-car garage. <laughs> so I always say that's true love right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then she's seen me, you know, drive two hours each way for Lehigh. And she's seen those things. And so what you said about the career advice, I had a former college athlete contact me two weeks ago, and I told him the same thing. I said, I would never encourage you to go into the college sector. Um, and then a dad who has a son who used to train with me said the same thing. And I said, listen, I said, the hours are crazy. And, um, you know, I looked at it like if I was to take the college position that was offered to me last, I would not be able to celebrate. Um, I wouldn't be able to take that Christmas vacation with my family every week when my kids have that break or they have a midwinter break, like an early spring break. You know, the teams I'd be working with would be in the thick of the season. And I said, well, what's that worth? How much money would they have to pay me to skip that? And the answer is, you can't buy that. You can't buy my family out of the equation. And so the only answer I have is, uh, you know, I would probably not go back, try to even go back to college unless my kids were out of the house. You know, kind of like Ron McKeefrey went back to the college sector. He, he says he's an empty, him and his wife are empty nesters. His kids are in college. He's got the available time. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope our field, you know, we are smarter than ever. I mean, the equipment is more advanced than ever. And the pay is still not for the amount of hours that these coaches are away from their families. I feel bad for their families, especially yeah. for the kids. You don't want to miss those years. My, my uh, second to last year at Liberty, from Father's Day to the end of the season, I had one day off. All, every Saturday, every Sunday. And I would make, you know, you know, 10, 12 hours, 10 hour day. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm getting up early. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I <laughs> hear people crazy. complaining that they had to work 10 hours you know, in another job, I'm like, geez, I'm I know you, you laugh at that. And so I'm at the high school, the high school I'm at, my salary in 10 months is greater than the salary that was offered to me at big division one universities for a year. And my work hours is um, at least half plus every holiday off, you know, hey, it's spring break. The, the school's closed. We're not going in. The kids could do some sprints on their own. The world won't end, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Well, I like you know, it, it, when I went down to Sornex, I didn't see any you know, self-worth. I saw no value in myself at all. And and, and Richard and, and Bert had to sit me down yeah. and explain to me thoroughly that I had value because I didn't see it. That's I heartbreaking would, to hear that, Bill. It's heart. It's heartbreaking to hear that. Because you just, you get so conditioned from the administration and coaches that that's the only value you have mm -hmm. is what you do on that platform, what you do on in the weight room coaching these kids. And I, I it was, it was a very difficult time and they gave me freedom yes. because of explaining to me who I was and what I had to offer. And I'm so thankful to them. I mean, I know, I mean, I can tell you stories about Sornex and, and, and how much I love them because not just because I work for them, but I've been buying equipment from them I was, for that was my for question. 30, close to 40 years. That was going to be my question to you. What was the first thing? I remember the first thing I purchased from Sornex. It was 2003. Maybe it was, I believe it was 03, but what was the first thing you purchased and where were you? We were at Liberty and we built a, the state of the art weight room uh, at Liberty and uh, Richard 
was the one who built all the equipment for us back in like 86. Oh and um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it was incredible. We had SEC school uh, strength coaches coming to visit our weight room and telling their AD, if a school like Liberty can have this, why can't we? You what know, were some of the, you know, when you had the vision, what was the main things you wanted? Was it the squat racks? Yeah, it was the squat racks. It was the modular units, you know, where you could do all the exercises at one station, you know, right, right. Before, you know, right. before it was, you had, it used to be the, you had your platforms, you had the bench presses, then you had the uh, 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 squat racks. And we, we said, you know, Hey, we just can't, we got to, we are the transition times between exercises. I did the math one time and I figured out how much time I was wasting in a workout in transition time and it became a, a sh way more than what we we ever thought it was and i mean if i only have 45 minutes and i have to be done at the college level in 45 minutes then i don't want to spend 13 of it in transition setting up and this so what was that 90s or 80s i was 86 oh my goodness yeah and so richard uh was a one-man army maybe he had one helper yeah, he was the one man oh, army. And uh, he came in and they've been so innovative. You know, yeah. and I went down in um, the early 2000s and uh, I said, guys, I, I get, I'm, I'm going to get a half a million dollars and I got to design something that's never been done before. And I says, I know there's only one place I can get that done. And that's when they came up with the base camps. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We were the original base camp. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, right. you know, yeah, you know, it was just, we just constantly, I, you know, they, not only that, but when, when I went, I went down to the world championships for the bench press in Miami mm -hmm. and I went over to the university of Miami and I was talking with their strength coach. And um, he said, you know, the great thing about store next is that they always come and check on my equipment. He says, if something's broke, they'll send somebody to fix it. And, and I saw it as a consumer 10 years after I had bought the equipment. I said, hey, we're having a little problems with this. We'll send someone to fix it. Right. Take a picture of it so we know what it is, so we know how to modify. Boom, they got it fixed. I never had broken equipment. And, right. and, and <clears throat> I, I told our athletic director when I designed the weight room, I designed the weight room so that 10 years later we could still bring recruits in and still show them around and it still looked great and it didn't have no broken equipment and you know that's that's why i went with sornix i got innovative equipment that was i knew was going to work and i won't say what company it was but our athletic department undermined me and decided to go for a smaller weight room with a different company Five years later, they trashed all that equipment and went and had to buy Sornix equipment. Yeah, because you got to buy stuff that lasts. I mean, yeah. you so, could save up front, but um, I tell it to my wife all the time, if we're doing something for the house, I don't want anything that's the second, third best, save me a few dollars, because then it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a headache down the road. I just want to get like the best <clears throat> thing now. And so- yep. You know, my first squat rack was from 03, and then I had it traded for another sore neck squat rack. I had a buddy that would clean out gyms and university weight rooms, and he had a, a sore neck half rack. It was actually more like a three quarter rack, um, but I think they called it the half rack. And I had an old sore neck half rack called the Acme rack that they don't make anymore. It was beautiful. And so I guarantee you that that thing is still. It's a tank. It is a tank. Like your, you know, my kids, grandkids could lift on it if I still had it. And so that's the beautiful thing, you know, about those guys. Um, Bill, are you in South Carolina or uh, Virginia? I'm still in Virginia. My wife is a uh, director of mammography for the Central Virginia Health System. And so she oversees, I think, nine or 10, 11 different mammography centers. Oh, serious. Okay. Yeah. So she's, yeah. yeah, he's very successful. Nice. And so it makes it difficult for me to just go and say, yeah, I'll take another job. Mm -hmm. 
it's got to be it's got to be a good job for me to you know 100 percent. you mentioned when you mentioned jesse he's like not sort of at the top of the list he's like at the top of the list of guys that i would just go to work for yeah i, I i'm with you 100 i love that guy yeah. i mean we are like long lost kindred brothers yep. it's it's scary <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's great and you know him and i are close friends we hop on the phone every week and oh. uh, i met him at summer strong that's yeah. where we met we he was just standing there and because i don't really follow much of you know nfl or even college stuff i went and introduced myself to him he was standing there we got to chatting and um yeah it was it was great and so we always we always hop on the phone so bill you know if a um you know university wants to reach out for you whether it's for like you mentioned you did motivational speaking for their team or uh, to do uh, educational like uh, in service um do they email you what what should i put because i'll have your contact i could put your stuff on the website but also the people listening so they yeah. can hear sure um my cell phone number is 434-660-9963 and my, my email address just use my sornix email is bill at sornex.com oh that's easy okay bill at sornex.com they could reach out and get squared away with you and, um, you know, the only question they can't ask is, can I have coffee to pick your brain? <laughs> yeah, I don't drink coffee. So, that I'm born raised in Seattle and I don't drink coffee. That but, is uh, funny. <laughs> All right. So you're that, welcome to join in with me on a workout. That's right. That's the best. So uh, everybody listening, want to thank you for uh, watching and listening. Uh, please visit our friends, our partners at sornex.com reach out to Bill. I mean, Bill can travel, obviously, and um, get your staff trained up. I think it would be inspiring and educational. I think you need to, ins our coaches need to be inspired. They work so much, they need the inspiration. And we, as we said earlier, invest in your people, not just stuff and things, invest in your people. So thanks for listening, Bill. Hang on as I shut this down, okay? Yep. Hang on one second.